Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever everyone is. Uh, welcome to the Binalo Talk. So this is uh, after a two-week break, we are going to restart the Binalo Talk again. Uh, and uh, for those who are not familiar, the Binalo Talks is a weekly uh, lecture or discussion hosted by the Archaeological Studies Program of UP Diliman. Uh, what we are trying to get is uh, to get more insights, not just from archaeologists or historians, but also from other uh, disciplines so we can uh, have a good discussion and start to think about new ideas, hopefully, the new topic. All the while, uh, we usually do this while eating our lunch every Wednesdays in ASP. However, we started doing this more online. Uh, I am Anna Pineda. Uh, I will be the co-moderator for this talk. Uh, I will be uh, joining us will be Arturo Tablan, who is also a co-moderator and a graduate student in ASP. Uh, but I think uh, just uh, some announcements. The Carl Hotter collections are now in ASP and it's being uh, uh, assessed and accessioned by the uh, Emil Robles' team. So you can, if you have any questions, you can ask him, especially since these are artifacts that were excavated from uh, Sohoton Samar uh, in, uh, I think, uh, Tacloban. All right. Uh, I, because I think there are students from ESP here. Uh, another announcement, please uh, please go to uh, ask your uh, advisors because our for advice because our enrollment will be in two days. okay? And finally, there is a call for abstracts for a conference that uh, ASP will be holding on August. Please take a look at our Facebook and also our website for all these information. So, uh, and with that, I think we can start. So I will call on Ellie Lim, who will introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. Okay, um, Jean Camelo got her Doctor of Philosophy in Civil Engineering at the University of Central, Central Florida with a concentration on coastal engineering. Her research focuses on, the her, on, her, on how hurricane properties affect the magnitude and inundation extent of storm surges and how they might look like in the future climate conditions. She primarily uses the numerical models to simulate these interactions. She is also interested in learning how to effectively communicate these hazards to the public. She loves scuba diving because that's the closest she could be to becoming a fish. On her free time, she likes to knit, help repopulate the monarch butterfly, butterfly population and watch the garden grow. Everyone, let us welcome Dr. Jean Camelo. Thank you. Salam. Thank you. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. I know this is a little bit different from um, what you usually hear. So today I'll be sharing with you some of the research that we've been doing on storm surge, particularly on, on the modeling side. So um, although a lot of the or all of the cases that I will be presenting is um, for the continental United States. Um, I hope that at some point you can find some parallelisms as well um, in the Philippine context. So yeah, so basically um, what I'll be showing you are things that I did for my dissertation. So the whole, um, the whole research is entitled um, the use of physically based models for storm surge risk assessment in cl uh, changing climate. So just as a background on how I got involved in this field. Um, so I got interested in storm surge research during um, basically my first year in 2013 when I was just hired to, um, to teach sa faculty, as a faculty sa civil engineering here at UP. Um, and it just so happened that during that time, um, you have Haiyan or Yolanda, and I think that was in November, and it just caused like this devastating surge the eastern part of the Philippines, which is in the Visayas region, I think around November. Um, so that's how I got pulled in into research. And, <laughs> excuse me, so after that, um, I started becoming interested in it. Um, so now, like, looking back, it, it kind of, like, sort of made, made sense how 
um, you know, like coming from the Philippines and going here, like I was immediately drawn into doing that. So anyway, um, just for like context of storm surge um, in, in the Philippines. So um, when you think about Yolanda, there's actually a lot of stories that when people share to each other, na, you know, what could have been done to prevent this such devastation, you know, like you've, you've seen these pictures a lot and you've seen the, the death tolls na amounting up to thousands. And there were a lot of um, reports where they were saying that um, initially people don't really know what storm surge is, but they do know what, what tsunami is um, because we just had one a few years ago that hit Japan. And they were saying like, if we use the same term, um, warn people about this big tsunami coming, they would have moved. Um, however, and this is, um, I just found this out recently that there's actually a lo local term for storm surge, which is the Luyong Nambagyo, which literally means tied from the storm. So when you put things in context, um, you know, these things are very important. So you have storm surge and tsunami, although they're both um, water related hazards, um, these things are completely caused by two different things. So it's very important to use um, the correct term of things. So um, when, you, when you talk about storm surge, there's actually two things that people use interchangeably. So this is storm tide and storm surge. So we know what tides are. They're basically, you know, the rise and fall of water because of the gravitational pull coming from the moon. So in some areas, you see one low tide and one high tide once a day. In some areas like Manila Bay, um, this can happen twice. So you would have a low, low tide, which is the lowest. And then you have like the middle one, which is low tide. And then you could have a high tide and a high, high tide. So those are, you call them semi or not because it happens twice a day. So um, storm surge actually happens when um, you have a storm or a, here, so U.S. and Taunglas hurricane um, in a distance, and you, it's blowing over um, the water, and this amount of water tends to pile up on top of each other. So um, this usually happens like towards a deep water, and when it goes towards the land and it gets shallower, so this wall of water elevates the normal water level. So that additional water elevation um, goes above and beyond the normal tide. So that is what you actually call a storm surge. So for example, um, I, so this like, I don't know if you could see the, the mouse. Um, so you have this like mean sea level, which is like the average of, you know, what the water level could be in a certain place. Um, you have this like two feet normal high tide and the actual water level you'd see is this um, 17 feet, which is storm tide. So if you subtract those two, the actual surge in contribution ng bagyo, um, which is just 15 feet, it's still significantly high. Um, these things you could also see in tidal gauges. So these tidal gauges, they record water levels. So this is an example from a NOAA tidal gauge in, in Texas. Um, so this blue, if you can see this like blue wave pattern, for example, that's your normal tide. So you could actually predict tides um, because they, re, they, they occur um, frequently. So um, you you're doing the same pattern for over 19 years. So you have this blue um, water level and then that is what you're predicting your water level would be. And then you have this green, which is what it actually was going to record ng um, tidal gauge. So this green you'd see like around September 11, you'd see it going up. So that's when you can say like the, the surge is happening where dumada na yung bagyo mismo. So this actual level, what you see from tidal gauge examples are, are tidal gauge water levels. Those are what you call the storm tide itself. So for, for my talk, um, I'll be using the term storm surge because of a lot of the things that um, a lot of the modeling I did, we took the, the tides out of the situation. So it's, it's normally just storm surge. So when you also talk about storm surge, you talk about storm surge risk. So you might have seen this equation before. Um, so basically you define a uh, risk of to storm surge is a product of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. 
So the goal is we wanted to minimize the risk of storm surge in the coastal community or coastal population. So if you wanted to do that, you know, basic math, you, you just have to minimize all of this three. Um, so your storm surge risk is very, very low. However, um, two out of this three, two out of three is almost always impossible to reduce. So for example, hazard, um, you cannot stop the storm from coming. It's, it's a natural thing. It happens all the time. So because of your storm hazard, you would have um, storm surge or flooding. And then the second one would be exposure. So it's where your community or your region is located in the geographical location. Although we are able to reduce the exposure of these towns, for example, so we build um, structures like seawall or breakwaters or anything that would act as a barrier so the floods wouldn't go in. Um, but usually these measures are very expensive and they are rarely prioritized unless it's too late when something already happens. Um, and lastly is vulnerability. So it's basically how a community is able to anticipate or cope the, um, due to the impacts of flooding. And it might seem like this is the easiest to fix, this vulnerability part. However, it becomes complicated because there's a, a lot of components that are oftentimes rooted in either socioeconomic, environmental, and you know, just like physical. And trying to minimize all of those things usually involve different government agencies as well. And a lot of times, like they don't want to talk to each other. So um, today, there's two things that I'd like to focus on um, with regards to surge risk. So one is the hazard itself. So I'm going to talk about storm surge and this surge risk. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in, partly because I do have a background in teaching, is I want to be able to learn how to effectively communicate this storm surge hazard. Um, so, you know, like you, you help out in um, reducing a community's vulnerability to the risk itself. So, um, so this is more of like the, the US context on, on how um, storm surge is being predicted. So basically um, storm surge is difficult to predict with just the meteorology. So it means that if, if you know anything about the hurricane or the storm, um, they're saying that you could right away know how much storm surge you can expect. So, so US, um, they have this, hurricane categories, which is basically based on um, the wind speed. This is one, this is an old um, category. So this is called um, the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. So this guy right here is Dr. Saffir. So he's the one who started this, um, this category. So um, it goes from one to five, where one is the weakest and five is the strongest. And these are the expected surge heights for each of the category and the, the damage. Um, I've tried looking up the Philippines, what they have um, in terms of storm surge. So what I saw was, um, uh, we're familiar with the storm signal. So it goes from one to five. And then um, if, if you can see the storm signal number one, so Filipinas is a little bit lower. It starts with 30 and goes up to 60. Um, in the US, it starts so one, 119 um, to 153. It's because like before it goes to hurricane, they have other categories at the bottom. So it would either be a storm, a tropical storm and tropical disturbance. So, um, just to show you a few examples of the cases here in the U.S. where um, at first they thought that if you have a very high category storm, um, you would know exactly how much storm surge you'd, you'd, you'd get. Um, in, in recent years especially, um, there's a few storms that prove that this, that is not true. So one of the highest storm surges that was um, measured here in the U.S. is from Hurricane Katrina, which is just a category three. So it's just, you know, right in the middle, which is about 27.8 feet. Um, there's a category five recently, which is Michael. This is in 2000, 
19, I think, um, which is a category five. Um, but as compared to Katrina, it's just 15.6. So it's just a little bit lower. So these are some of the situations wherein you can't really say that if you have a high category of storm, you would immediately have a high um, storm surge. So um, this, I guess like this, uh, this citation right here of Rappaport 2014. So if you read a lot of um, storm surge literature or studies here in the US especially, um, a lot of them cite this study in particular, which basically says that if you looked at hazards brought about by um, tropical storms or hurricanes, um, the primary cause of death is actually storm surge. However, um, what we have found out is we looked into the, the reports um, of, of all of this 2,325 deaths. Um, and we found out that majority of those deaths that are reported that are due to storm surge, 95% um, of that is because of Hurricane Katrina. And only 5% is because of the other storms. So this is just from 1990 to 2019. So it might be a little bit different, but um, I guess my point is, um, this are one, one of that, um, I guess like over generalization of something, um, but it's a little bit skewed towards uh, one storm, which is Hurricane Katrina. So I guess like just a background of, of what I did. Um, so my research in particular is um, I wanted to know how this hurricane properties affect storm surge itself. So when, when you talk about hurricanes or storms, you can describe them in several different ways. Um, and basically you can talk about their property. So one thing that we are all familiar with is the intensity. So this is where they get the, the categories or sub Philippines, the signal. So intensity is basically the, the wind speed. So I have this like moving graphic right here. So the whole storm itself is this colorful blob. So it goes to the Philippines. So the intensity would be like this different color bands. So the red one would be you'd have like the fast moving winds. Here it's called hurricane strength winds. Um, the next one that you also might be familiar with would be the, the pressure. So the pressure is usually measured at the center or the eye of the storm. So this is um, also called the central pressure. And then another one is forward speed. So basically it tells you how fast or slow the whole system is moving. So for this system, for example, it usually measures like how, how long does it take from this storm to get from this point to this point, for example. So that's your forward speed. Um, and then another one would be the size of the storm. Um, usually it's measured in radius. So um, when you measure the size of the storm, usually you go from the center and you go, you find where the hurricane strength winds are. So for example, this storm, you would consider it to be a large storm if, if you're assuming that the hurricane, uh, hurricane speed winds are the red. So you go from here to here. So medyo malaki siya. I mean, you could also see it from, from the picture that it almost engulfs like um, almost half of the Philippines itself. And there's other factors too that could affect how much um, a, a storm surge would be. Um, but for, I guess for our purposes, um, Yilang, we'll be discussing about this, this four things. Um, usually in storm surge, there is this consensus that if you have a low central pressure, a very high wind speed or high intensity, if you have a large storm or um, large radius in a very slow forward speed, um, people immediately think that you would have a very large storm surge. Um, and one, well, one part of my research is like, we saw that is not always the case. Um, so, so that's that for um, the hurricane properties itself. So how do we actually study storm surge? Um, so basically we could, um, we could categorize this in two major groups. So the first one would be a physics-based model. And the second one would be a statistics or data-driven model. 
So when you say physics based model, like you can um, you can describe anything, any physical event, <laughs> excuse me, using mathematical equation. So a subtype of this physics based modeling is actually um, doing physical model, excuse me. So let me play this one. And you should be play. Um, th that's okay. So you've probably seen this video. So this is a, a wave dam. Well, they have a, a paddle right here. So it's it's making waves and they're able to actually study some of the physical processes um, by visual where they could do measurements. So for this one, I'm not able to play this right now. Um, so it's actually a wave maker and they're trying to see how mangroves are able to stop this, this waves from coming in. Um, this is a, one of the largest um, wave basins in the US. So this is in Oregon. So you have different paddles you're able to like um, control how big or small the waves are. And like here towards the end, you can build um, scale model of things. So you could build actually a community to test out um, how would the flooding be? How would your barriers or your seawall would um, interact with these waves? Let's see if this one moves. Oh, now it's moving. So yeah, so this one is an example of a, of a physical model. So you can see the wave maker, and then basically you have a mangrove, and at the back of the mangrove, it's it's still. So this physics. Uh, physical modeling has pros and cons. So pros is you're able to visualize, you're able to see this physical processes. It's it's a good teaching equipment. Um, you're able to test equipments how <coughs> they um, they're able to withstand this wave forces. Um, a con would be one thing. It's very expensive. Um, the setup needs to be varied constantly, especially if you're testing different things. Um, you're only limited to certain variables to experiment on. And because a lot of the scale models, you have to make it very small, some of the physics gets distorted. So you're not able to produce what is actually happening um, in real life. So what I do is it's, it's, um, it's called a numerical model. So basically um, you take this systems of equations. So what we solve is called shallow water equation. It's a little bit um, scary to look at. So you have this partial differential equations, for example. And um, what numerical modeling basically does is um, it translates all of these equations into something that the computer can understand, which is basically addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So you don't have to solve this like calculus equations. So you take these equations and you make a model out of it and you're able to um, translate this phenomenon into something that you could run in your computer, wherein you put all of the inputs and parameters. You don't have to solve this. So it's already been programmed. So for, um, for the numerical model, the pros are, you're able to describe the physics of a system very well. Um, there's a little less modeling constraint because of scale, um, because for uh, in comparison to the physical model, you don't have to build small houses, for example, you're able to like, because um, this everything is done in the computer. So you're able to build um, roads or like you're able to basically um, draw the shoreline, however big it is. And a lot of these models are actually free and there's a lot of community support. So it's easy to get to get into. So a con of using the numerical models, it's very expensive because you have to use a lot of computers and usually these computers are not like desktop. So you have to do computing, so, excuse me, sorry. In um, HPCs or you have this like big room with a lot of computers and it's very limited in how good you can reproduce the systems. Um, it depends on how good your surveys are, for example, in a lot of these things, there's very steep learning curve. So if you don't have anybody to actually teach you, it's to get into the numerical model. But as I said, there's... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of community support. So even if it's a steep learning curve, once you get past that, you'd be able to do your numerical modeling. Oops, sorry. 
So the second type of the modeling is called the statistical model or more data driven. So what it does is it basically use information from the past to train their model. So what they do is they gather um, for storm surges, they would gather sea level data. You get info on weather parameters like wind speed, sea surface temperature, pressure, for example. And then you have all of this data and you try to come up with the relationship and you can basically train. Um, you've, uh, you've heard of machine learning Segura, before and you basically train your computer to be able to recognize these patterns and these parameters. And then it would tell you how much surge you can expect. So um, since you're just basing on this data and a lot of them are just you know, parameters, there's a lot less physics involved. So you don't have to know um, those calculus equations, for example. So this is fairly new also, um, the data-driven model, the statistical model. So the pro of this is in, um, compared to the numerical model, it's very cheap to use. You can actually run your statistical model just using your desktop or your laptop. Um, you can get results very fast because you're not running all of these equations. Um, a con of this is the data is not always available, especially um, if you're looking at places where they don't really care much about information or um, your the data is not <clears throat> excuse me, not free. Um, and sometimes machine learning can also be biased because um, it depends on the person training the actual machine program to do it. Um, also, it's since um, you're just basing it off data, if it's incomplete, there's questions about accuracy as well. So um, going back, so what I do is I, I do numerical modeling. I use this model called ADSERC, which is basically, it uses the full physics model. It solves that equation, the calculus equation that I've showed earlier. Um, and you could um, use ADSERC in different meteorological forcing. So you can um, put in wind speed, pressure, things like that. Um, you could also have ADSERC solve things that um, with waves in general, so not just storm surge. So these are just examples of, um, uh, I guess like we call it computational grid um, for for ADSERC. So this is where we solve those equations. Um, Tito sa parang black dots. So going to the first part of, um, sorry, I'll have an intro. Um, going to the first part of the actual research that we did. Um, so we wanted to actually study how hurricanes would look like in a changing climate and. Um, as we know, and we were talking about it a while ago, that climate change is very apparent nowadays. Um, usually, we wouldn't get here, here in Florida, you wouldn't get um, hurricanes this time. Um, and um, last year, actually, there is a record breaking number of hurricanes that made landfall in the United States. Um, and we've seen that a lot of um, wildfires, flooding, etc. So, so those things uh, that aggravate the climate change. So, for our purposes, or for storm surge concern, we usually um, keep an eye on predictions that would say that in the next hundred years there will be a shift towards having stronger storms meaning um, you have high wind intensity and lower pressure. There's also going to be an increase of the storm size itself. And the storms itself are go, um, moving very, very slow. So when we hear things like that, like, you know, it, it gets us alarmed in the storm surge community. So how we did that is actually, um, we are, so what I do is just storm surge. So we have a collaborator that does the atmospheric modeling itself. So we get the, um, the hurricane data from, from them. So we use this model. So this is a different model called WARF. So with WARF, you're able to simulate um, weather data. Um, so what they did is from the years 2000 to 2013, they were able to simulate um, hurricanes in the US in the present climate. 
And then what they did was they put climate change signal into the model, which means there's um, a heating of the sea surface. So medyo mainit yung sea surface temperature. And they were able to see how this hurricanes would look like in the future in the next hundred years. So the objective of this study is um, how would the wind intensity or the wind speed and other hurricane characteristics affect storm surge? And how would this um, hurricane changes would look like um, in terms of storm surge in the next 100 years or 21st century? So um, just showing you the result of simulation of the simulations we did. So this is um, Hurricane Ike. Um, Hurricane Ike is one of the biggest storms they had in 2018, so it made landfall here. So this is um, the Gulf of Mexico, and this is Texas and Louisiana. So this would be the present um, Hurricane Ike, and this would be future Hurricane Ike when, when we have a very warm um, sea surface. So at first glance, it doesn't look like you have a lot of change. But if you subtract this future minus the present, you can see the actual changes here on the right. So what you can see is you see a lot more red, which means that in the future, we can expect a lot of um, increase in storm surge itself. Um, this is only for the case of Hurricane Ike. So we did um, 21 storms. Um, and uh, what we did is we actually um, aggregate all of them together. So um, these are the maximum surge levels for all of the 21 storms. This is the present and this is the future scenario. So again, if you just look at them, you don't really see any much difference. But if you subtract them, you'd, you would see it here. So you'd see a lot more red, which means that in a lot of places, there is going to be actually an increase of surge, uh, surge heights because of this changes in hurricane parameters in the future. Um, what we've also noticed is there's a lot of places where the surge heights are just concentrated, so it's not very widespread. Um, but what is alarming, again, is it goes beyond one meter. So a lot of places are going to be more flooded um, in the future. So um, this one, we did this graphic to illustrate the hurricane properties itself. So like I said, um, what the consensus in the community is, if you have hurricanes that have a high wind speed, um, a low pressure, a large radius, and a very slow translation speed, that would cause um, big storm surges. So those are darker bands. So high, uh, sorry, high wind speed, that's dark blue. Um, large radius, that would be a dark orange. A slow translation speed would be green. And then pressure would be, a uh, low pressure would be in pink. So what we found out when we group these storms from smallest to largest inundation volume with how much water it actually came in, we saw that, or we were expecting that this one, this storms at the bottom, you'd have all of them in dark color bands. But when what we saw is like, for example, Irene and Ophelia right here, they should be moving down, um, but it's not. So there's really no discernible pattern in general in terms of um, this hurricane property. So this is for the present. In the future, we, we also saw the same thing that um, you see this one, Ophelia and Earl and Irene. So it means that um, these hurricane properties are going towards um, what we expect to cause more storm surge. So you have an increase in wind speed, an increase in size, a slowing down of translation speed, and the pressure goes lower. However, they don't seem to move. Um, you'd see the darker bands up top also. So it doesn't really affect the... Um, the storm surge heights itself. And if you look at this last five storms, um, the color bands don't have a discernible pattern. So from there, what we saw is you cannot really, um, you cannot really know what or how much storm surge you can expect from just knowing this hurricane parameters itself. Um, so, so this is just, 
um, showing the same thing that I showed you before, where we got the percentage uh, percentage change itself. So again, if you look at this this bottom where you have um, the largest changes, you don't see that similar pattern um, as well. So just to recap that part, um, what we saw is we saw that in the future, we can expect that there's um, an increase in inundation volume and um, extent in the century. The hurricanes are going to be producing larger storm surge levels in the more concentrated areas. And you cannot predict how much this surges would be um, just by looking at a single hurricane characteristics. You'd have to like look at um, look at that whole entire thing. So, okay, so the next part would be, um, this is more of like a, a surge communication. So I got interested in this because like, I, you know, like you do all of this search modelings, but at the same time, it takes, um, what, what we as a scientist do is sometimes it's very difficult for what we think we understand um, doesn't necessarily translate to what the public understands because there's, um, there's this big gap of um, perception. So this is a, um, I guess like a good graphic of how we see weather forecasted. So, you know, you want this general public to go to where you are. So in terms of surge, um, we've seen before that um, when you talk about storm surge itself, there's a historical association. So if you know, um, if you have this high surge category, you immediately know that you would have um, high storm surge. So that the, the research question for, for this one is, how does that historical association with the wind intensity or the category influence storm surge risk communication? So what we found out is the perception of the public with regards to storm surge depends on these um, three things. So basically the first one is geographical um, location. So a lot of the people living in the coastal areas, they're, they're, they're very aware of their hurricane hazard concern. So they know um, about storm surge, but if they're living, you know, high up in the mountains, they're more concerned about winds itself. Um, the second would be experiences of, of the past experiences of people with previous storms. So you have residents that are more prone to storm surge itself, like they're very well versed and they know what to expect. Um, the third one is the source of information. So you have this official source of information and then um, it gets related, related to people using um, the television or now Twitter or the newspapers, for example. So um, again, in the context of US, um, storm surge is officially communicated using this way. So they have this graphic. Um, they usually tell you how much storm surge you can expect in a certain region. And then they have um, usually like, like a message up top. So this is during hurricane. Um, Laura, where they call it unsurvivable. So um, using this language, like you're able to urge people to move. So parang tinatakot nila. So, and then you have this storm surge maps that are available all year round. So basically it tells you that, you know, for, for certain places, you could expect that for, if you have a category two, for example, you could expect that your heights would be, you know, like two feet or three feet, for example. Um, I tried looking at how storm surge being communicated in the Philippine context. So this is what I found. So I think this one is the official one from Pagasa. It basically tells you, um, they say storm surge warning number two. I don't think this is, um, and um, if someone is more familiar, um, I think I don't think this is related to the storms, uh, public storm warning. So also this one tells you what you can expect in certain places and how high they are. And then this one I got, this is what I saw from Project NOAA. It's, it's also similar. Um, what I like about this is they have this graphic of a person. So it tells you that I guess like 1.5 would be considered high storm surge level. So um, what we also saw is even if you improve your communication, there's still certain reasons why the public is very hesitant to move when we, you tell them that, you know, it's not very safe for you and this is how much surge you can um, expect. 
So first you have this anchoring effect where the coastal residents basically um, expect that their damage would be equal to whatever category is. So if they knew that a category two would be coming, they wouldn't think that it's very strong as compared to if they know a category five would be coming, they would um, immediately move away. The second would be um, there's a non-linearity of damage. So again, they think that, you know, as you go up one, two, three, four, five, the damage would be linear. But as we've seen earlier, you have storms that are only category three, like Katrina, Katrina for example, the storm surge would be 28 feet, as opposed to, you know, just, uh, you know, a higher category of category five, where the storm surge was 15 feet. So it's not always, you know, like a, a linear relationship that it goes up. And sometimes you have different hurricane experiences as well, especially with the residents that are living there for, for a very long time. Um, and what we also found out, there's a lot of personal factors that um, affect this hesitancy of the public to heed this official communication. Um, so when you say personal factors, this comes in with all of the, the social, I guess like the social science part of it. So one is like race, gender, income, disability status, and educational attainment. So in the case of Hurricane Katrina, they found out that um, the, minor, uh, the minority population are very eager to move. Um, women are very eager to move. They're the first ones to actually come out, um, get out. And, okay, oh, and then, um, and then they found out that usually college educated white men, they're the last ones to move because they, you know, they actually think that they're able to survive um, the certain things. There's also behavioral factors, um, the lack of security and financial constraint. So in the case of Hurricane Katrina, it happened um, August 27. So it's towards the end of the month. Um, like in the Philippines, for example, you know, towards the end of the month, like you don't have money anymore. So you know, there's a hesitancy to move because you have to pay for gas, you have to, um, you have to, you know, check in in the hotel if, if the uh, relocation sites are not available, things like that. Or oh, some people, they stay there because they're so scared that, you know, their things are going to get stolen. And the last part would be confidence in authorities. Um, you know, these are places where they are usually forgotten or there's sometimes, you know, they promise that they will fix things, but it never happened. So um, those things that people are actually hesitant, even if you improve your storm surge communications, they're still hesitant in, in moving and actually following the directions. So basically, um, just to, uh, I guess, like to conclude um, that part of the study, um, so this is very eye-opening for me because I went in with the idea that, you know, maybe if you take out the um, Saffir Simpson wind scale, the category one, two, three, and then just, you know, focus on the storm surge, people would actually um, see what you see and they would evacuate right away. However, what, what we saw is it's very much, it's a very complex issue and it's made out of different systems. And to actually improve the communication, it's just a very little part of it. And um, there's a lot of social economic factors involved um, that play in the risk perception itself. And it's very multidisciplinary and it probably needs several out of the box solutions. And even if you know, we get the best modeling done, we really need to learn how people, how to get to people to understand what we see um, as scientists, for example, because scientists in general, we're not very, we're not trained to communicate very well. That's why we need the help from, from you guys, from social scientists, for example, or science communicators to be able to share what, what we found out. Um, we also found out that because of this personal factors, like you need long-term planning to actually reduce the vulnerability and you know, once you have this residents evacuate, how would you be able to have them come back and return to place without financial constraint and have them rebuild and be resilient for, for the next storm that is coming? So what we found out is, you know, the storm surge communication problem is very interdisciplinary. And 
you know, just like learning about the hazard itself is, is not enough. That's why we need, um, we need to involve a lot of people in a lot of disciplines itself. So just, just final thoughts. Um, there's still a need for physics-based modeling because um, the changes or how much storm surge inundation or heights is not easily predictable by a single hurricane characteristics or just knowing the intensity or the wind speed. And lastly, which I think is very important, that there, there is a need for interdisciplinary work from, from the physical science and the social science aspect to help improve um, uh, storm surge risk communication itself. Um, with that, thank you very much for listening and I'm open to taking questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jean. Uh, that was a very interesting talk and I think I, uh, there's already a lot of questions and it's good that there's a, an avenue for discussion for this. Um, there's a question here. Uh, let me just uh, put in my... Yeah, I have I have the question up if you want me to read it, Anna. Oh yes. Uh, can you ask? Yeah, so it's from from Don and she asks, uh, uh, if 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 the model is applicable for exploration for e extrapolating future hazards in different scenarios, what can it also can it also be used to model the hazards in the past conditions? If it is, what are the data requirements and can these be acquired or derived? Um, actually, yes, there's, um, there's actually a paper I saw recently where they modeled um, storm surges in the past. Um, this is data well beyond um, what we have right now, like be, even before 1800. So a lot of those things, since we don't have data, um, well, this, this will actually require, you know, scale from people that does atmospheric data that they'll be able to reconstruct um, what happened in the past. So the WARF model would be good for that. Like, for example, if they know, you know, what would be a prehistoric storm, for example. Um, so that's all the things that they would know. Um, but if, if you reconstruct things like that, especially if you don't have anything that could, you know, you could, you could verify it with. So Mejo, I think it would take a lot of um, education, educated guess, siguro. Um, but yeah, it's, it's possible to do um, those modeling in the past. Okay, uh, I think there's another question uh, uh, from Bryce R. Hi. Oh. Uh, Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Good morning. I have a question for Dr. Camelo. Since we work for uh, uh, um, development planning, um, I, I saw that from your presentation that there's a significant difference from using the uh, the old wind system for um, um, showing the the risk hazards for storm surge in coastal areas. Uh, since uh, most of our work, and also as a matter of fact, that here in the Philippines, most uh, of our um, uh, towns are located uh, around and by the coast, um, would you say that there, there would be a need uh, in updating what, we are, what we've been using um, as references for storm surge hazards in the Philippines. And maybe if you have insight on how that would be done. Thank you. That is actually a very difficult question. Um, like, like, to be honest, I'm not sure how storm surge, how Pagasa does storm surge, but I am familiar with how I think Project NOAA did their hazard mapping. Um, so what they did was they they had, um, they simulated storms for uh, 1950 to, I would say like early 2000, 2010 maybe. Um, and that's, and then like from, from the simulation of those storms, so they get their um, water levels and that's how more or less you, you could expect the flooding. Um, so like, like everything else, like 
you know, these things develop when, when you have newer models, newer data. So there, there should always be an update. And, you know, like every single year we have different people graduating and like they become experts in it. So yes, like it, sh it should be updated. Um, but I'm not really sure how, how Pagasa does their model. Um, so for, for this one, what we did was this is just, um, sorry, this is just the hurricanes itself. So another thing that if you wanted to look at things in the future, you could also add um, sea level rise, which is what we didn't include. You could also look at how, you know, like your coastal regions are changing. So those are the things that you could, you know, add into your model. And when, when you factor in these things, like the sea level rise and the change of the coastal areas itself, like it, it becomes more complicated, but at the same time, you know, it gets you closer to the truth. So yeah, so I guess like short answer is yes, like it needs to be updated all the time. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question here in the chat from Anthony de la Cruz. And they ask, uh, first they say, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, and their question is, in the US, how has storm surge forecasting fared in terms of accuracy? For example, if the warning slash forecast says that the storm surge will be 20 feet, does the actual storm surge come really close to 20 feet? Um, that is actually a good question. Um, so the the way they did this their warnings i don't know if like sorry let me see if i can oh it's over here they don't give you an exact amount of surges so i don't know if you're able to see my graphic right here so they give you a range of surge so um so for example it goes from 10 to 15 feet so at, at that point um uh you can get actually um in in that range but not very precise so um it's it's a lot more complicated with just trying to prove that you know like these things are um you know that these things actually happen um because at, at this point if you have a surge that is 15 to 20 feet at this point it's it's actually very devastating already so um, no, it does not actually come close to 20 feet, but it comes within the range. So it gives you about, you know, like five, five feet in range. So it's, it's very, it's very huge. But um, yes, the storm surge um, of uh, official warnings are actually um, accurate nowadays because you, you have improvements in the weather forecasting system as well. So there's, it's it's a lot better this this these days. When it comes to, I, sorry, I have a question, and yeah, I guess it uh, it adds on to the other previous question. So when in in the US do, do they use all of the the modeling systems when it comes to predicting, or is there a comparison? There is, is there always a comparison between uh, or a combination between the statistical and the physics? physics model um, yeah that's actually that's actually a very good question so it's it's actually a combination of, of two so what what they do is um, so I can say so for example you have you have this storm that is going to reach this area and you know that your storm is like here so what they do is they actually have they actually they run thousands of models or hundreds of thousands of models. And from there, um, they would do probability and statistics to, to arrive at this. So yes, it's a, it's a combination of, of those two things. Uh, how, how quick can they do it? Right? Yeah, so like, um, so for, for, the, for the US itself, um, usually they do, um, so these are done every six hours. So once you get a forecast, you'd have to have your storm surge um, graphic at, within an hour. Because otherwise, um, if, if you do it after that, it's not going to be good anymore because the, 
next official forecast would just happen afterwards. So yes, like they can do it within an hour. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, and, but to get to that, there, there needs to be fun. Where do people get funding for this? I guess that's one of my questions. Oh yeah. So like for, for this one, this is actually a, a government agency. So they already have like those funding systems in, in place. So yeah, they have a lot of money. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, I because when it comes to disaster and risks, uh, I guess this is not. It's been demonstrated here that this is not just a site. Uh, it's really using the data, data driven materials to answer questions regarding people, people's movements as well, and how people should move, uh, and making community and making new developments i would suppose and has this mm -hmm. been, has this been affecting how development how communities are i would say mga cities developments within the cities or uh in the future because uh it looks like there's also predict you're already predicting how high the models are how high the storm surges are going to be within the future so are are there are they listening i guess that's also a question yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's actually a really good question. If if in regards to if they're listening or not, um, I wouldn't know, but I know that in some places they actually employ people who would just do this. So a lot of urban planners, for example, or people who do public works, like they they already know. Um, so this thing, so these things are not new from them. So they they are informed. Um, you know, like like everywhere else, you know, there's a lot of places that are already established, so you can't really easily move people. Um, for example, here in Louisiana, there's a lot of an ancestral lands, Rin. so there's a lot of hesitancy to move because you know, like you, your family owned the land and you've been there for a very long time. So instead, you look at other measures such as you know, like building a seawall, for example, or having you know, like a green land in front of them to help mitigate those risks. Um, but um, how can I say this? Like a lot of the. Um, a lot of those things, like with the mitigating factor, especially here in the U.S., they're on the state level. So, in the Philippines, na you know you have you have a budget for for the whole entire country. So, these ones are you know it depends from state to state level, and um, there's a lot of places here, especially in the Gulf, that don't have a lot of budget as compared to you know California, for example. So, a lot of those things also get overlooked. And I guess it's also from a lot of uh, it's also the case with a lot of uh, communities and government systems, and even in the Philippines. I have another question, but there's a question from the chat. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a follow up question from Anthony. Uh, during an actual storm, how much lead time, lead time do people have to evacuate between the time that the forecast is made and the time that the storm surge hits on the coast? Uh, I believe there are some technologies in, play, in place to protect landslides, but these technologies are rarely used because there's just not enough lead time for people to evacuate, given that landslides as a hazard are really abrupt and quick when they take place. So I guess, yeah, sort of how, like how, um, how much time do, do people have to evacuate from storms? So usually they give them as early as 72 hours to, to evacuate. Um, so it's, how do you say this? It's a little bit more complicated because if you tell people, you know, five days ahead of time that you have to move, there's, um, there's a lot of, I guess, possible things that could happen. Like, you know, if you tell them, you know, it's going like five days ahead of time that it's going to hit your city and then it doesn't happen, you would, call, um, you would cause what they call shadow evacuations. So these people who don't need to move would be moving and the people who actually need to move don't move because you know you, you didn't tell them to do that. Um, but from what I know, it's, it's about 72 hours. If you do it, um, if you do it ahead of time, there is, um, well, a lot of times what happens is your weather forecast 
is not as accurate as when you get closer to um to those places and this is also um i guess like one of the reasons why i'm saying that you need to you know run your models every single time there's a storm that's happening because like um if if you for example um let me see so this one so this is um a storm surge hazard map for example so if for example uh sorry if the tv tells you that there's going to be a category storm happening and you live somewhere here if you go to look at this map and you see that oh i'll be hit with you know like five feet of storm surge for example but the storm is hitting this way it doesn't happen so um, there's a lot of um, times that you'd have to pay attention to what is actually happening as opposed to, you know, like Googling, like um, how much storm surge would this place would have if there's a category storm happening. So, yeah, like, um, yeah, seven, 72 hours is is what they usually do. Um, because like after that, they're although they're improving um, the weather forecasts in general so if the weather forecast is good um we're able to tell people earlier if they need to, to evacuate or not but otherwise you know if you do it earlier on you, you'd have you'd run into a lot more problems and at the same time you know you get a lot more people become hesitant that um what you said that didn't happen so i'm not going to move anymore I was also thinking that that when you when people start moving, they should move to idea. Theoretically, they there's a, an evacuation place uh, that they can go to. So, but what people usually do is that they also they look for relatives or uh, second houses that they think are safer. So that's where they move to. But other people don't have that option. Their only option is to go to the evacuation centers, and that's a very uh, I guess it's also a social class uh, issue mm -hmm. as well. So that should also be addressed. Uh, but yeah, then, and um, sorry, yeah, I was just going to say like in places like Florida, for example, um, there's a lot more older populations here. Oh, so yeah. you also have to think about, you know, if I go to this Mobility. evacuation center, is there like a medical facility close yes. by? Um, or there's some people that has pets. So can I take yes. my pet with me? So yeah. Yes, and also children, number of children, so that's also, mm -hmm. a, and what materials do you need to bring, so how for how many, how many days, I guess that's also one of the questions that has to be, that they also have to think about depending on the days that the storm surge will happen. Yeah, um, actually, uh, here, so like Florida, for example, there, there, a lot of people are used to um, seeing this, so they usually tell you, you know, like for each person in your family, like you have to allocate like four gallons of water each day, for example, for you to be able to like eat, drink, or, you know, like wash your hands, things like that. Um, since it's been happening all the time, um, a lot of people are more prepared. Okay. So that makes sense. But it yeah. also, that, that will also require cars, I would suppose. Um, yeah. And then sometimes... Um, there's uh, the issue shelter in place, so you don't really ah, have okay. to move. All right. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, but so, I have uh, well, I have a question regarding that. But uh, there's a question here from Bryce. Uh, considering uh, as a follow up, considering how we find that the research and methodology used in the study provides invaluable information that could affect people's lives and properties, especially. Uh, when you look back at Yolanda, could we expect any future study from your team that's going to be located here in the Philippines? I don't know, but yeah, I'm I'm open to the possibility if anybody wants to collaborate. Like I said, you know, like this this is a very small community, and we appreciate people collaborating with us because you know, like that's that's how you move science further um, when you get everybody to collaborate with you. Mm -hmm. We, I was discussing this with one of the participants of the background, and I was thinking that it will, will it be harder, or is there any changes when it comes to factoring in island settings? 
uh, consider this. These are all coastal mainland information. Am I correct? So will it? Yeah. Change? Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, so like in the Philippine context, for example, um, you know, we have a lot of water. So like usually when the hurricane comes over land, um, it gets it weakens a little bit. And then when it goes over water, like it picks up strength. So like for the Philippine context, like that's very important. Um, also, I think I remember what happened with Yolanda is it's just, you know, like all of these factors intersect with each other. So you have like that geography, um, they have a reef that caused like the, um, the surge to go higher. Um, I remember they were also saying like, it's just the shape of, um, I think it was like Tacloban, like it looks like a funnel. So you have this like massive amount of water that gets like pushed into a small, um, a small area. So, you know, water is not going to go anywhere. It just goes up. So those things like, um, and also like the way, I guess like the way storms are formed in the Philippines. Um, I'm not very, very familiar with that, to be honest, like, you know, like this meteorology is also different in the Philippine context. So yes, like what I found here in the US might be different, um, but um, one thing's for sure, like you could always transfer methodology um, from one place to the other. Yes, and I, I think that's also interesting to see and hopefully considering that all the factors that we have, that island settings have and you mentioned the models and their pros and cons. So maybe there's something when it comes to funding, we can look into the pros and cons plus all the factors that we have to look into considering the island setting. So that would be interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think there's another question or two. Yes, and another follow-up from Anthony. Uh, he says, sorry, you might've mentioned this during the presentation yeah. and I might've missed it. Uh, during an actual storm, when the storm surge forecast is issued, uh, is the basis of that forecast historical data or is it uh, data from the actual hurricane? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. So it's it's a combination of both. Um, so I, okay, so the way um, the National Hurricane Center uh, does its forecast is so they have. Um, they have the current data, so they know the location of the of the hurricane, the wind speed, the pressure. So all of these properties they know. Um, to be able to forecast, what they what they do is they look into historical data. Um, that's what they do to extrapolate um, those things. So they know that, like you know, if your storm is located here, what's the um, I guess like the uh, the likelihood of it going, you know, like left or right. Um, so that's yeah, that's that's how they base all of this because they have to like if um, if you guys remember young storm property. So the way they do that, they have to do it over and over again with different combinations. So that's how they arrived into. I think it's like 800, they have to do it 800 times. So they just change all of those combinations. So those things usually come from historical data as well. And because they have this like good record keeping, um, they're, they're able to, you know, like use those data from before and um, use it to improve their uh, forecasts. How, how old is the oldest historical storm data that the U.S. has? Um, so U.S. itself, I'm, to be honest, I'm not quite sure, but um, with, the, with the tropical, they call it tropical cyclone reports. I think the oldest that I found was like 1950s maybe, mm -hmm. um, but even if they don't have it on paper, like written, um, this sometimes they have, you know, like older cities, for example, like Boston, um, they actually can find um, the storm surge records from, from tidal gauges. Um, so you could go as, as long as, I mean, as far as um, when these things are, are installed. Interesting. Okay. And that's something that... So that's uh -huh. yeah. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, like, that's, that's how they, they're able to, like, you know, reconstruct the past also. From from all of those like um, 
date for, from all of those like gauges as well. Are there any studies that you look into the historic the historical storm surges? Um, or just as yeah. a as a as a historical uh, event, I would say. Um, I think I've seen a paper that reconstructed like a storm in Florida in the 1920s. Like they didn't have um, those reports yet, but they're able to um, reconstruct it using the, the tidal gauges. Um, I did one, uh, when I was still working in UP, we did this um, historical runs of storms. I think we did 30 years because um, that's how far we could get from uh, the Pagasa data mm -hmm. in the um, Japanese Meteorological Association. So from those historical data, um, you know, like you're able to inform your decisions in the future. So a lot of times when you do engineering work, like, you know, you just add like this like safety of safety factor um, when you when you size things. But you know, you can't just add if you're doing a seawall, you can't just say 10 meters because historical data said like the highest storm surge would be like eight meters. So I'm adding like plus two. So um, I guess like a lot of them are educational guesses based from um, your the historical context. That's uh, Michelle Yusebio mentioned here from that for the Philippines, typhoon records go back as far as Spanish colonial period, but I doubt if Pagasa used them. Uh, I will actually... Yeah, I will say that uh, because uh, I know someone who does the flood research in Pagasa, so yeah. they actually do use the Spanish colonial period records. The problem is, I think, in terms of development, uh, it's yeah. not being followed. So there's also that um, issue. Uh, when So that's why I think there's also a lot of reconstructions of, um, of the flood flooded areas within Metro Manila, for example, I'm, it, it can be predicted and storm surges can also be, uh, they, they have some idea on storm surges, but the prop, I think it's also the development because it, it, as you can see, I guess this is also a, a thing that's happening in the US, coastal areas are prime properties. So there's yeah. a lot of developments that's always happening there. There's more, you can see that in a lot of, um, uh, in a lot of cities, there's uh, higher there's skyscrapers now in near in coastal area, and I don't know how how uh, advantageous that would be considering the possibility that these these are you're exposed to seawater consistent. If there's uh if there's a possibility of flooding of storm surges. Uh, in that area and every year and how often the storm surges happen. Uh, I don't know how it will affect uh, city development when it comes. And this, I think this will also be um, the same here in the Philippines. Has, I, I guess I already asked about that, the, the, the concept of development. So um, uh, I have a question regarding the relationship between storm categories and damage no. categories is there um is there have you seen a model or are do you are do you think that it's possible to put them together to make it more socially acceptable so instead of saying storm category one risk number ganyan and then no. damage category plus so there's a lot of additions happening in a lot of in people's minds so maybe there's a way to put them all together yeah so um so the uh how do you say okay so like the reason why they had this saffir simpson scale so originally um the historical context of that was uh i forgot which one i think it's dr saffir he was a he's actually uh, a civil engineer that assesses wind damage on structures so that's how it started and to make it more simple, um, they kind of put the storm surge levels with the category itself. When, when it was first started, when it was introduced in the public, like you said, it's easier to say 
you know, um, category one, and you know, this is what you expect. Um, you know, since climate is changing and there's a lot of possible weather um, conditions that can happen, not, not all, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time that, you know, when you have category one, you can only expect one feet of storm surge. So that's how it started. Um, and then I guess like in the 2000s, especially with Katrina, since they said they're expecting it's a category three when it's going to make landfall, they don't think that it's going to be a high storm surge. Excuse me. So, and then they had other storms at the same time. So like 2005 and then another one was a category two, but it was also high in 2008. So from there, they started thinking like if we keep on just advertising categories, but at the same time, um, the level of the range of storm surge is not in that category anymore with the old scale. Um, why would people believe, you know, that this always happens? So in 2012, um, they actually separate, they made the decision to separate it um, so people can actually focus on just one hazard itself. So it might be counterintuitive that, you know, you're adding a different um, communication instead of just having one. So that's why they're saying that um, it's easier to do it separately because like um, you're able to tell people that, you know, just focus on one thing. So that's, that's the reason for that. There's a lot of um, like researchers also here that are campaigning to just scrap the Saffir Simpson scale altogether because it doesn't work. Like it doesn't fit all of those things. Um, so you get like two, you know, opposite sides of the spectrum. Um, there's also people that are saying that why is it one, two, three, four, five? Um, when sometimes the difference is just, you know, one kilometer per hour and you could already go to category, you know, a higher category. Um, so, I have a friend that suggested maybe we could do 3.5 or 3.9, for example, kind of like an earthquake, um, major logarithmic scale, Sha, Nisha 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's actually, you know, like, uh, I guess, like a research topic, Rin, like, how would you best to communicate um, storm surge? But officially, that's what they did. They just separated it. Okay. And actually, I found it interesting yung ano, uh, yung dam yung risk and damage, uh, ad ad I guess, or because it points out what it's going when you make it numerical. I would suppose na parang it's very uh, abstract, but to actually say that there was uh, a damage or a risk, this is the risk that you will get. Then, as a community or as a person, then that would be uh better communi communication sa social sa mga people but in fact it doesn't really it doesn't remove that these ito, yung hurricane categories because for scientists it this is how you can do measurements i would suppose pero when it comes to risks it, there's also a different measurements yun yung iniisip ko yeah so Ito, yung damage, it's usually damage because of wind itself. So that's that's how they assess um, the damage. So yung damage with regards to water, um, like you said, there's a different like perception of risk involved. So it it might it might vary from person to person as well. So for example, what I think is already catastrophic, maybe because you're not affected, you don't see that flood. Um, so you moderate lang. And but you know, we are both under category five. Yes. Yes. So it's it's very abstract. And wind damage when it comes to a lot a lot of people, because I remember this uh uh nagbang, nga na this is wind category, pero a lot of people when they hear wind, parang hangin lang yan eh but hindi naman siya too big so parang but not really realizing that there's a, a combination even me hindi ko rin may isip dati na parang hangin lang yan eh ano ba magagawa na hangin but it turns out malaki pala 
Yeah, like for example, sa Pilipinas, 'di ba? Um sa atin kasi ang bagyo, it's usually it's very wet. Mm-hmm. So, this one we're just talking about the coastal flooding, pero we haven't talked about yet what happens when you add the rainfall. Yes. Tapos, you know, like problems with urban drainage as well. So, this this damage can exacerbate even if you just have uh, you know, like lower category. I I remember mm-hmm. before they would cancel classes just because it was um signal number one. Yeah. But, you know, for us, signal number one is very low. But at the same time, in other places like Malabon, for example, yeah. <laughs> they're not able to, to go anywhere because it's just the floods are just so high. Definitely, yeah. Also, and Michelle Isabio mentioned here that our typhoon scales should be more experiential according to how Filipinos experience different typhoon strengths. So that makes sense, yes. Um, um yeah but i i kind of have i guess like a comment for that since you know if if you do it more experiential so that's where you put in a lot of bias for example so it depends on who you ask like you know if you think if you ask someone who lives in the coastal areas oh like for for you public signal number one do you think the damage is minimal or you know extreme Mm -hmm. sometimes they would say no like public signal number one it's very catastrophic for me already because i live very close to the coast Mm -hmm. but if you ask someone in manila for example who's living you know in 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 a a condo (laughs) yeah like or someone very sheltered public signal number one would be like, no, we go to the mall or something like that. Like, we don't really care. So that's why I think that it still should be based on, you know, things that you could quantify. Mm -hmm. Like wind speed, for example, that's quantifiable. And magandang communicate. Ah, yeah. um, Sorry. What I mean, yeah, combine uh, what you call this, aside from experiential, uh, magkasama din yung facts like wind speed and all. Yeah, but um, it will be a lot of work. Um, but it, yun nga kasi nga, iba't iba ang impact sa experience kapag signal number one, say, depende sa location mm-hmm. or depende sa or environment. So, medyo madugo siyang trabaho in terms yeah. of of communicating disaster risk. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah it, you don't want to inundate weird, everyone with the, the, data. <laughs> yeah, Oh, I think kasi yung sa mga nalalak ko, yung sa mga students, so they were in STS, they were, chinachallenge namin silang gumawa ng, tawag nito, yung, partic- yung, yung culturally sensitive na disaster scale. So a bunch of them, yung pag-ulan ng pinipili nila, di ba may iba't ibang level mm-hmm. sa ulan? Minsan para maging more visual, kasi dapat maintindihan ng mga bata. Like ang analogy na ginagamit nila, like ilang tabo, ang tubig, yung katumbas ng kapag ganitong kalakas ng ulan. Tapos, tapos pag bagyo naman, like, minsan they put visuals kung gaano kataas yung yung alon or it will be in in local language then So, yun nga, designing a disaster communication ay, yun nga, dapat particular nga sa sa lugar combined with, yun nga, yung facts like wind speed, height ng alon, tsaka yung kung ano na yung yung something na familiar sa kanila so kasi yeah. madalas kasi oo oh, oh, madalas kasi di- distant madalas kasi yung language distant kasi sa kanila so yung ginawa nila sa si Japan yung Shindo scale if if anyone is familiar with the Shindo scale talagang sobrang close to their culture na eh. kuyari ano yung gumagalaw ano yung extent ng uh, yung ano ba yon kapag kuyari pag magnitude number one yung lindol Yeah. Um, hindi lahat hindi nakakaramdam lahat tapos yung parang ano siya yung depende talaga sa experience nila like halimbawa ano ba yung the highest magnitude nila seven yata yun talaga yung gumuguho na yung buildings at bumibiyak na yung lupa yung mga ganun yung something they can something na relatable uh, importante din na relatable yun yeah so, totoo eh. actually um, sa, sa storm surge For example, yung mga maps na pinakita ko sa inyo, even if, you know, iba-ibang kulay. So, for example, when you see red, you get very alarmed. Pero, you know, what does four meters mean to you? Um, sa, sa akin, to be honest, I'm still having a hard time visualizing those things in meters. Pero, for example, if someone tells me na, you know, the, the level of storm surge in comparison, for example, um, yung Rizal Monument. So if I have that picture ng Rizal Monument and then you tell me na two meters of storm surge would be 
I don't know, like hanggang siguro dun sa, dun sa base ng monument. Or if you say eight meters, di mo na siya makikita. So if you have something that's more, um, like you said, like everybody knows in public, tapos um, you have those like water levels, like it's easier for us to explain. Um, actually, isa pa yun, na parang when I was looking at how Pagasa communicates their storm surge levels, um, I don't know, I think, maybe siguro luma na yung nakita ko, they communicate it in mean sea level. So for someone na nakatira sa bundok, ano yung mean sea level? So parang wala kang visual context kung ano yun. So I think like when you when you make maps, you have to make sure that a lot of them are um, in the, the datum itself, kung ano yung, yung basis mo, um, you know, how high you are elevation from the ground not not mean sea level because otherwise you know if it means like there's two feet of storm surge from the mean sea level pero you're living somewhere na 10 feet above mean sea level it doesn't mean anything to you pero sa mapa you'd see that oh it's two feet pero you know you're not gonna see that i i'm also thinking that uh you're right because pero di mga at saka may mga mini ano yun mga mini uh weathers or cl- many wet climate conditions in a certain geographical area. So pag kunyari sa rainforest, how much rain uh, com- combined with storm surges in the coast and but in the mountains there's uh, they're used to there's also flooding or there's a high number of uh, ng pag-ulan. So may bababa, you're not just being met with storm surges from the from the mm-hmm. coast, there might also be water, water that's coming in from the mountains, and bababarin sa river. So, how, uh, how, how can you factor all of those in? Ng mabibisan and communicate yeah. effectively that will be understood by people from both the coast and both uh, sa mountains and in different uh, house settings, housing settings, yung mga, and in a local language. <laughs> Yeah, kaya the, I mean, like for me, for example, I I, I wouldn't know kasi hindi ako nakatira doon, diba? So that's that's why we need help from, you know, the social science people and people are more familiar with with where everybody is. So you you bring the science locally um, para at least, you know, I mean, you spend a lot, of, like for research, for example, you spend a lot of money just trying to figure out these things, pero hindi naman siya nagagamit eh, kasi you're not able to, um, to bring these results into something local and something tangible, for example. Um, I'm not sure sa, sa pag-asa, pero here in the U.S., they started hiring social scientists and science communicators sa, sa NOAA, for example, for, for them to help out. Um, ano yung messaging na would be effective to encourage people to move, for example? Um Kung, kung may baha or, or anything or tornado, paano, paano mo may encourage yung mga tao na lumipat? Yes. That's ha. Uh, and I think yun yung isa sa mga kailangan pag-isipan rin ng uh, Philippines and other places rin, especially now with the changing climate. Okay. Uh, Wait, I think, uh, may uh, ano ako? I'll go ahead. <laughs> uh, Jen, kasi um, I think isa rin sa mga problems, one of the problem, biggest problem here sa Philippines is yung, aside from the communication dun sa public, yung policy makers din, mm-hmm. right? I, 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 know, I know you've worked with the government and then you've submitted, uh, you know, proposals and all that kasi you were part of the consultation. But then um, there were some uh, issues na, as to the reason why na it wasn't... Uh, hindi natuloy, kumbaga yung project na yon. So, yeah. um, I think it's a big factor din with the ano, policy makers na to listen, to, to actually listen to uh, scientists and to the, cons- yung, the, the consultants that they actually consult and pay. So that's Yeah, that, that's actually true. Pero at the same time, you know, they they have these consultants who do like fancy modeling and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you have to like gather everybody. You have, you know, this, this community also at na um you have a bunch of stakeholders so yun it has it has to be um everybody in agreement 
sa, sa lahat. So like for, for the Ross Boulevard Seawall, for example, so we presented the results um, and then it's, it's not as easy. Like, you know, you, you make this compelling argument that you have to do a certain thing, but at the same time, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with a government agency. So you talk about budget, you talk about, um, what was the other one? Uh, I think it's a national historical yung yeah, sunset. The sunset. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you have to deal with that too, yung historical uh historical significance ng place, tapos yung yung business owners at the same time, yung hotel, um tourism board. So, yun, it's it's complicated. Uh there's a comment here from Dr. Isebio, uh, not on storm surge. Uh, but the alert levels for Ta'al are too technical that grade school students cannot understand, which makes sense. Uh, and that's something that, uh, again, uh, social scientists and even educators can also help with. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that will be the final. Arturo, are there any other? Yeah, I think uh, not to hold uh, Dr. Camilla too long, considering that it's almost uh, midnight no, over there. Sorry. But yes, uh, yeah, again, thank you very much for this really interesting talk and, you know, this really, really lively discussion, you know, on, you know, very, you know, very pertinent uh, um, studies and information, you know, surrounding storm surge and all that. Um, yeah, if anyone has, you know, further questions, you know, um, if uh, Dr. Camillo can leave uh, any contact information, whether that be uh, an email or something like that in the chat, hopefully. Uh, oh, yeah. So that, yeah, sure. if you could, you know, just to reach out for further comments, questions, or right. even, you know, maybe, you know, reaching out to that partnership that, uh, that you know, could happen uh, in the future. So, yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, okay. I think that's, well, we're, well, well, that's where we'll end things today. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, Anna? Uh, thank you so much. Again, thank you so much, Miss. Uh, Jean and uh, thank you Ellie for the invitation as well uh, inviting thank you uh, thank you everyone thank you Arturo uh, I really learned a lot uh, so I think a lot of people are very interested in this again uh, and it's very uh, not just in terms of interest it's also very important to uh, talk about and to learn about it and to get people uh, dif with dif from different backgrounds talking about the importance and how to how to uh, move forward from here. All right. Uh, thank you again. And for next week, uh, we're still finalizing the, the topic, but it will be a professor from PUP who will give a talk. Uh, there's still, I think it will be, hopefully it will be about the legalities of Philippine uh, claims in Sabah. Uh, in at the south so that will be an interesting topic for next week uh but for now we will uh we will leave this at that uh the current the information the email of uh the speaker is there in the chat i'm sure there's still a lot of questions uh but thank you again Ms. Jean, for answering a lot and having thank a very you. lively discussion I really enjoyed it. I think everyone enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. And thank you, everyone. We will see you again next week. You can just like the Binala page, uh, the Facebook page, to check out the time and the title of the next uh, lecture. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.